Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. And just before I start, I don't want to forget, Laura, here's a little something that I got for y'all from Tommy's birthday celebration. I made this on my computer. I thought y'all might enjoy having it. You're welcome. And I put the picture we had of Angel in one corner, and I put the picture of you and Christy in the other corner to kind of personalize it some, you know? Amen. Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 1, and if we would stand in honor of the reading of God's Word, and I shall be reading today from the New King James text for a little bit of clarity and understanding. The word of the Lord reads, What shall we say then? Shall we continue, continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall have shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What, shall, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves to righteousness or of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanliness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
It's not very often that I read an entire chapter to start a message with, but today I wanted to read that chapter because Really, if you're, if you're going to not butcher scripture and take something out of context, it's hard to know there where to stop. Uh, because really, you can't hardly do it. So I said, well, I'm going to break form and we'll read an entire chapter. And I'm not going to do a word by word exegesis on this, so don't worry, we won't be here until 10 o'clock tonight. But I think we have a, a simple message that God's laid upon my heart for this moment. And that message I would call choosing success. Choosing success. Would you bow your heads with me? Master, we love you so much. And we're so thankful, God, for another opportunity to hear from the word of the Lord. Master, at this hour, we would ask that your anointing would rest upon your servant, God, that you'd help us to deliver the word that you've placed in my spirit for this hour. God, that it might bring forth fruit unto righteousness in the ears of the hearer. For we ask it... In the lovely name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated. I don't think there's really a singular portion of Scripture that is probably more commonly misrepresented and misinterpreted than the portion that we have just read. Paul is encouraging the people of God to aspire to a place of holiness. He is encouraging them to aspire to a place of righteousness. It makes me laugh when I speak to people who don't know anything about the affirming movement or they don't know anything about our church, and they somehow get it in their head that we do not aspire to holiness. That because of who we are and because we accept people within the confines of their humanity, that somehow we're not holiness, you know, we're not righteous. We don't believe in righteousness and godly living, when in reality nothing could be more from the truth. Absolutely we believe in it. You cannot claim to believe the Scriptures, and you cannot claim to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and not embrace the concept of holiness and righteousness. I may not embrace it to the level of high head and long dresses, but I certainly do embrace it. Amen. In the King James Version, Romans chapter 6 and verse 13 reads, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Children, I want you to understand today one point. If you leave this service and you don't get another word I say, I want you to understand what I'm about to tell you right now. It is easier to succeed in Christ than it is to fail. Amen. It is easier to succeed in serving God today than it is to fail in serving God. Some would suggest that every time a child of God misses the mark, they have fallen short of the grace of God and excuse themselves from their place at the Master's table. Heaven forbid. God God is always mindful of the reality of our humanity. The difference between our unregenerate, unbelieving humanity and our regenerate or believing humanity is we now live our lives subject to and ever striving to be yielded to the purpose will, and plan of God for our lives. What separates a believer from an unbeliever? Well, a believer is striving to live their life in such a way that they're walking in the will and the purpose and the plan of God for their life. An unbeliever is not. And yet the Bible still tells us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now there are many who misrepresent the salvation message in Christianity today who tell you that the 
writing of the Apostle Paul which states for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God is speaking of universal sin meaning that all humanity stands before God in a state of sin before they believe and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ that is wrong that is false that is a misinterpretation of scripture the world has never been trying to glorify God it never will try to glorify God Paul said for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God therefore the ones that Paul was writing to and the one Paul was writing about was one like you and I today who strive to do the perfect will and plan of God for our lives and yet along the way we falter along the way we stumble along the way we fail Paul said you're in good company for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Even the one in church who thinks they're the most righteous, who think they've been able to uphold the code and live up to the law, to the letter, so that they feel confident in themselves that they have not missed a single thing. And I don't celebrate holidays, so God will honor me. And I don't do this, so God will honor me. And I don't do that, so God will honor me. But honey, there's a spirit of self-righteousness and a spirit of pride within you that God detests. You see, pleasing God isn't about what you do. Pleasing God is about who you are. David, the psalmist, you want to talk about somebody do something. That man could do, if he had five choices ahead of him and four of them were wrong, uh, right, and one of them was wrong, he'd pick the wrong one every time. David just knew how to walk into trouble every chance he got. And yet, the word of the Lord tells us David was a man after God's own heart. Why? Was it because of the things that David did? No. It was because of who David was. Because David was the same man who wrote in the Psalms, Oh, create in me! a clean heart, and renew a right spirit within me. God knew that in the midst of all his failing, God knew that in the midst of all his stumbling, David was crying out from his heart, Oh God, make me right. Oh God, help me do right. Oh God, I want to be right. Hallelujah. And that's what made David a man after God's own heart. It was the state and condition of the heart and spirit of this man that made him a direct, indirect contact with the very heart of God. Amen. See, God's not looking for you to do everything just right. He's not expecting you to be just perfect and just absolutely everything that, you know, that a human being can possibly be. But what he does want us to do and what Paul was really talking about in the text that I read this afternoon, what Paul was really talking about was yielding yourself or yielding your members over for use to sin, allowing yourself to be used by sin. Paul was not talking about uh, the difference between perfection and imperfection. Paul was talking simply about the difference of selling yourself out to something or withholding yourself from it. Tommy, there's a lot of things I can do in my life. Stupid things. Dumb things. That I can trip and stumble and do. But you know what? There is something inside of me called the Holy Ghost that will not allow me to sell myself out to it. Amen. It won't allow me to allow myself to give myself over to that thing. 
Because Paul said, the minute you sell yourself out, the minute you give yourself over, you become whatever it is you're selling yourself out to, servant. You become its slave. You see, there's a lot of things. I could, and I don't generally, but I could have a drink. I can drink an alcoholic drink. It doesn't bother me in the least. I have no desire for alcohol whatsoever. I could care less about alcohol. And whether I drink a drink, if I were to bring a, a, a fifth of whiskey or whatever they call it up here right now in front of this church and pour myself a cup and drink it in front of you, why there are some churches in this area that would just, they, they would, they'd be turning over in their graves to know that he did what? He took a drink. It's not in the action. I can take a drink and it doesn't harm me, it doesn't hurt me, it doesn't bother me, it doesn't affect me. I'm not going to become an alcoholic over it because I don't have a disposition toward that. It's not in the action. But you know what? If you're not careful, if you allow circumstance and situation and the enemy of your soul, if you allow them to work against you toward the destruction of your spirit and your, your life with God, they will bring you to a place where one day you're looking at this thing and you're realizing I've reached a place of decision. I've either got to sell myself out to it or I've got to walk away from it. Amen. I can't stand to go into bars and clubs. I don't like the environment. I don't like it at all. Tommy will tell you I'm telling the truth. I do not like the environment at all. As far as I'm concerned, for someone to go into those places constantly, every single day, all the time, and find themselves comfortable and happy being there, you have got to sell yourself over to it. Hello now. You have got to sell out to the compromises that such an environment call upon you to make. You've got to agree to those things. Well, I hate being in a smoky environment, and I hate being around a bunch of drunks acting like fools, and I really don't care for people coming on to me like gangbusters. Uh for no reason but just that they're a bunch of perverts who can't control themselves and you know and but all of a sudden in order for you to be able to do that on a regular basis and be perfectly comfortable and happy there you've got to sell yourself out to it and every time I go into it every time I'm in one of those environments my spirit is saying I ain't selling out to this trash because I don't like it, and I'm not going to sell out to it. I'm not going to allow myself to buy into the notion that this environment is an okay environment, because it's not. Amen. Because you've got to be careful about the decisions that you make. Because if you compromise yourself too much, at some point you may find yourself somewhere that you really didn't mean to be, Initially, Lord have mercy. The term that the Apostle Paul uses that the King James translates yield or yielded in the Greek means literally to place beside or to put at disposal, to present, to make an offering of, to stand before, to provide. You see, so many churches just love to preach that portion of Scripture as though every time you give in and you allow yourself to do something that you know you ought not to have done, that you've become the servant of sin. No, that's not what Paul said. He said when you present yourself, for that purpose, when you walk up to the altar of Satan and say, here I am, do with me as you will, I'm 
selling out to you. I'm letting you do whatever you want with me. That's when Paul said you become the servant of sin. But as long as you're a child of God who is striving to fight the good fight of faith and wrestle the issues of flesh over spirit, which Paul said are constantly in contradiction to one another, then children, you're on the winning side. And don't let the devil, don't let a pope, don't let a priest, don't let a prophet, don't let a preacher ever tell you any different. Amen. It's easier to win this thing than it is to lose it. You've really got to go somewhere. You've really got to give up some things. You've really got to compromise some stuff before you can lose your salvation. And people that tell you, oh, it's as easy as just putting a cigarette to your mouth, you know. Laura, you know what I'm talking about. There's churches believe that way. Oh, the minute you put that cigarette to your mouth, bless God, you're headed to hell. The minute you put that drink to your lips, you're headed to hell. That may be a believer. I remember a man years ago when I was, <clears throat> a matter of fact, I was just a teenager back then because I didn't even have a church yet. This is before I started my first church. It was right here in Fort Worth. And one day a man came up to me. He said, sir, you're a Christian, aren't you? I said, well, yes, I am. He said, can you help me? And he just started crying. And I said, well, what's wrong? He said, I went to the door of my house today, earlier today, because somebody had rung the bell. And I opened the door, and there stood my ex-wife. And in my ex-wife's arms was my little two-year-old boy that her new boyfriend, husband, whatever it was, had decided to beat up on. He said, there was my kid all beat up. And my ex-wife with her mascara running down her face because tears just streaming out of her. She didn't know what to do. She didn't know where to go. Terrified she's going to lose him if she goes to the emergency room because then the state's going to step in and, you know, And he said, sir, if I ever wanted to murder somebody in my life, I wanted to murder today. He said, but instead of murdering, he said, I did something I haven't done in probably 15 years. He said, I've been serving the Lord for 15 years, and I've been in church for 15 years. He said, but I was so angry I didn't know what to do. So I went and got drunk. And I sure knew he did because I could smell it. What's my answer to this man? Oh, your actions have disqualified you from the grace of God. Your behavior is reprehensible. My God doesn't want anything to do with a drunk scoundrel like you. Is that my answer? No, that's not my answer. My answer was, you left your house this morning, the Son of God, and you'll enter your house tonight, the Son of God. But I hope and pray that you'll not sell yourself out to this experience you've had tonight and allow it to become your master, but rather recognize that the enemy has gained an advantage on you momentarily. But honey, like a boxer in the boxing ring, shake off the dust, get back up on your feet, and come out punching, because the battle is not yours, but God's. And when it's all done, you will win this war. That's my answer to that man. Amen. Because Paul didn't tell us every time that we caved in to the flesh, every time we catered to the carnal, every time we gave in to a physical desire or want or lust or temptation that we all of a sudden were on the wrong side of the tracks. No, that's not what Paul said. It's not what he meant. Heaven help us know. But he did want us to be forewarned. Children, just be careful because those failings and those faults, they can either be a little glitch in the highway 
or they can become the off-road to your undoing. Amen. And he wanted us to know that we had to be careful. Don't let it become the road to your undoing. Amen? Amen. I love how the Lord put our salvation and the security we have in him in context. In John chapter 10, verses 25 through 31, Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believed not, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I will give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Laura, that sounds pretty secure to me. But now I'm going to read this just because we're an apostolic church and I can't miss the opportunity to make a point. The Lord goes on to say, My Father which gave them unto me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. But then listen to this next statement. I and my Father are one. (laughs) Why is he using that side-by-side analogy? You can't pluck them out of my hand. He said, but the Father, the Father's not a physical flesh and blood man standing in front of you. The Father's greater than I am. He said, and no one is able to pluck them out of his hand. But guess what? I and the Father are one. We're one and the same. You can't pluck them out of my hand, honey. You can't pluck them out of the Father's hand. You can't pluck them out of the Father's hand. It's because you can't pluck them out of my hand. Because we're one and the same. And you know what the reaction the Jews had? To the Lord saying this, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. (laughs) For man to declare himself to be God was blasphemy and deserving of immediate stoning. That's all I'm going to say on the oneness of God. That's just a little side throw in there, okay? Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, or when you return, strengthen thy brethren. The Lord was fully aware of what was going to happen to Peter. He knew of Peter's denial. He knew what was about to occur. But the issue here was not Peter's failing, but his reaction to his failure. Hallelujah. Do we get right up after we have been knocked down, or do we allow our failure or shortcoming to rule over us as though it possesses some supreme power and we are powerless against it? Some people let their failings rule over them. And they just admit, well, I guess I'm just powerless to resist it. I'm just powerless to stand against it. If there's anything I can't stand, somebody talk with a gutter mouth. I've lived with it my entire life. Had a mother that did it my entire life. Cuss and swear like a sailor's parrot. I hate it. I get tired of it. And don't stand there and give me the attitude, well, I do this because I'm powerless to stand against it. It's just me. It's just who I am. Baloney. Somebody in the gay lesbian community, you know who you are. You know what a struggle you had coming to terms with who you are. How in the world is somebody who can't keep their mouth under control and can't exercise any form of self-control, how are they going to dare to compare that with being who you are. Amen. I get tired of that crap. I really do. I get tired of it. Because don't you know that when you sell yourself out to something, 
when you give your member over to something, when you allow your mouth to run and rattle and say whatever it wants to say, whenever it wants to say it, and you don't put up a fight, and you don't strive toward a more godly representation of yourself and a better, you know, more positive uh, manner, you've become a slave to that. Now it rules over you. Over you and you have no power over it is to say that the blood of Christ is without potency. Galatians 6, the Apostle Paul also writes, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Paul said, what should the reaction and the response of the church be when someone is overtaken in an area of weakness? He said, restore them. Your actions should be restorative, not condemnatory. We don't suddenly shun you. We don't suddenly uh, have nothing to do with you. No, 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 no. He said, restore them in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest thou also be tempted. He said, bear ye one another's burdens. Don't you know one of the reasons why I come into church is so important? People just love to tell me how they can serve God without coming to church. I just love people telling me why it's so unnecessary that they come to church. And yet, the Bible tells us, bear ye one another's burdens. Honey, if you're going to be out there by yourself without the church, that means you're going to have to carry the full weight all by your lonesome. Amen. But when you've got the strength, when you've got the integrity, when you've got the character of the church corporal behind you, suddenly it's amazing how much more you can do. Amen. Isn't it interesting how one man can't, you know, lift up a certain rock and yet one other man will come and he'll help you, and all of a sudden that rock boy, y'all can just pick it up just as fast and as quick as you please. Now, one man couldn't pick it up. How much more strength did he have than you that when he came on the scene, suddenly you were able to pick it up? That's not the issue, is it? You don't think of it in those terms. You don't say, well, if I'd have been just 5% stronger, I could have picked it up on my own. You don't think of it in those terms. No, because when two people come, it doesn't matter whether he has just enough strength in him for you and he to pick it up together or whether he's got enough strength in him for you and he to pick up two of those rocks. It doesn't matter. The bottom line is that when you put the two together, you're able to do something that the one cannot. And if you put three or four or five or six or 20 or 30 or 50 or 80 on the job, now you're able to do even more. That's the principle behind the church. We're part of the body. We're all single cells in the singular body of Christ. And we all work together to compensate for one another. Your weakness may be my strength. Amen. And your strength may be my weakness. 
And I'm able to benefit from your strength and you're able to benefit from my strength. That's part of the purpose of being part of the family of God and being part of the church of God. <clears throat> Simply stated today, I want to let you know that we're in a We're in a situation today where we can choose success. We can choose to be successful serving God. We can choose, we can make up our mind, I am going to win. I'm going to make heaven my home. I'm going to serve the Lord. And choosing success is a very simple matter because it all has its foundation in voluntary submission. Amen. Paul said, Unto whomever, unto whatever, you present yourself and offer yourself as an offering or present yourself and make yourself available to whoever, wherever you do this, Paul said, that's who servant you become. Guess what? By coming into the house of God today, you presented yourself as an offering to the Lord. You presented yourself for service to, to, the, to the Lord. So you know what that means? According to Paul's principle, amen, you're the servant of God. Because you've taken your members and you've put them in a place where they were in a position to be of service to Him. And not out in a bar room somewhere. And not out in a club somewhere. And not out on the street messing around somewhere. So therefore, the very action and the very act of coming into the house of God is presenting your members to the Lord. And Paul said, unto whom ever you present your members. He used the term yield in the King James. But he said, unto whomever you present or offer as an offering. He said, that's whose servant you are. Amen. So a lot of people out there today wouldn't think twice about coming into church. They wouldn't even, they wouldn't even give it a thought. No, because they've picked their masters. But when we make an effort to come into the house of God, to be part of the family, we allow him over and over again, week after week, to see, Lord, once again, I'm making you my choice. Amen. I'm voluntarily submitting myself and surrendering to you. Amen. To be used of you. Praise God. Choose success today. Choosing success is very easy. Keep doing what you're doing and you'll get there. Amen. It's easier to win this thing than it is to lose it. Would you stand with me today? Master, we're so grateful, God, for your word. We're grateful, Lord, for this day. We ask God today that you would take this simple word of exhortation and help it, Lord, to find its mark in our heart that we might be encouraged to choose this day to serve you, to choose this day that we will be successful in our efforts to know you and to serve you and to love you. Master, we just ask God that you would allow your word to bear fruit in our hearts unto righteousness for your name's sake. For God, we do strive after righteousness. We do strive to be more like you. We do desire every day to have more and more of Jesus reflected in us. Master, grant all these things we pray, for we ask it in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God and amen. Ooh.